about speaking and helping each other, but then one of them thinks that maybe it's you cucumbers or the audience. Not really sure where to place it. And to be honest, if I were to be live and see one of these, I'd probably not recognize what it is because it's got a very exaggerated man or it's a Chinese corpse. But once you recognize that it's a heavy corn egg, when you talk about these, you'll see the proboscis, the collar region, and then the trunk. And if we look closely, we see the pores, presumably somewhere on the trunk.
from the people that we got to study tiny bears. They can help the general overview of how these tiny bear biology. And then my strategy is, is in this class is always to compare asteroids versus meteoroids. It's a way of additionally introducing features of the tiny bears in general, like the water vascular system, as well as by comparing amongst these two groups. We were almost completely through with that. We'll finish up this morning, and then we'll talk about echinoids, otheroidians, and crinoids to complete the lectures on echinoids, the and then we'll talk about the many chordates. So those of you who came in kind of late, um, earlier in the semester, we talked about development. I had a little movie at the beginning and showed the sea biscuits life and the life history of the life cycle of these beasts from microscopic examination with mostly carnivores, not all, there's some exceptions, but mostly carnivores are dioecious. They are separate male and female individuals. Those individuals spawn most in most cases. Something No. Does that mean? No. No. <laughs> most most species spawn their gametes, and fertilization takes place in the water column. At the very least, males spawn, and then females will capture the sperm, and fertilization takes place with females. Females then can be capable of brooding embryos. But this is you know, a lower frequency of cases than those that engage in um, fertilization within the water column external fertilization. There are also a few species, we heard about um, Olothroidians, an example of Olothroidian on Monday. Somebody gave an example of, they dissected a Olothroidian, and the individual was hermaphroditic. But there are a few species that are hermaphroditic within the various groups. But for the most part, mostly kind of dirts. Spawn gametes and fertilization is external. Fertilization takes place. We talked about cleavage already. These are deuter stones. They engage in radial cleavage, formation of a blastula. And then, like we'll see in most invertebrate groups, brain invertebrate groups, they have distinct larval stages that they exhibit. These are covered in ciliary bands. And many are given distinct names based on general appearance, like area, brachialaria are distinct morphologies, recognized as distinct stages in advanced brachialaria. Then parts of the cells in the larva begin to form what will ultimately become the juvenile. And it's a rather dramatic metamorphosis from the larval stage, which is bilaterally symmetrical, to the juvenile and then ultimately the adult stage. When we talk about larval development of marine organisms, larval ecology, back when we had a lecture on development, we briefly talked about how some species have larval stages that are feeding, and some species do not. They undergo direct development. There are some species of sea stars, asteroids, that have direct development. Most of those are the brooders in which the embryonic stages are brooded until they hatch as small humanoids. Ophroids, similar, oh, let's see, see some individuals coming together and spawning together, a group of individuals that are spawning. These are very similar to asteroids in terms of dioecious external fertilization takes place. Major difference is in the morphology of the larvae. These types of larvae have very extended arms associated with them, known as the general gluteus larval type. Which 
have this particular larval stage, and for convenience sake, I'm going to kind of see Ophiocoelia. Okay, so I'm going to draw a line here. Ophiocoelia larvae, though, they don't occur in asteroids, even though these are sister groups, at least based on recent molecular results show that these are sister groups. And a group that has Clutea larvae are the echinoids. And sometimes I can spell. Ophiocleides and Panocleides. Here's a diagram of the general anatomy. And these things have ciliary tracts that extend around the length of the arms. They also have a complete digestive tract. So too do the bohexin area and the brachial area of asteroids. These are feeding larvae. So in the beginning movie, for those of you who are there, that's a larval type of an echinoid. Those were moving around and feeding. Complete digestive tract. One thing with regards to asteroids is since, since almost about 10 years ago, they have been affected by what's, what's called the wasting disease on the west coast of the US, on the west coast of North America, in which case you can find individuals that just simply appear to be wasting away right in front of you. You return to visit locations. I, I, I grew up in Southern California. I would often go to high schools in Southern California. When I go back to visit, I like to go bring my kids to see those high schools and nieces and nephews and so forth. So I like to visit those. It's very different community of organisms present now than what there was in the past. One of the things that is largely missing are these Pisaster species that are usually predominant in low winter tidal areas. So this darkish sea star wasting disease has really impacted populations on the west coast. Not clear exactly why this is impacting them. It's presumably related to changes in conditions. It doesn't appear to be due to any kind of virus or bacterial infection. Those are, those are related to it, but the exact cause is not really known. Last year, there was a paper that came out by Claudio Aquino and co-authors where they examined the surface. This is supposed to be the surface of a sea star. These are little ampullae that are the branchial, dermal branchia that are engaged in gas exchange within asteroids. And what they conclude is that you have an increase in organic matter, increase in temperatures, promote increased biological activity on the boundary surface of the asteroid, which causes a reduction in oxygen in that boundary layer. So you're essentially suffocating the starfish through these increases in temperature and increases in organic matter load into coastal waters. That's one hypothesis to explain this. One thing, switching gears a little bit, with regards to brittle stars, brittle stars exhibited you know, general body plan that is well recognized as a brittle star. The vast majority do. Brittle stars are rather easy to recognize. One of the groups that deviates from that main system are the basket stars. We will not have any live basket stars in lab. They were not available for us, and the ones that we had from last year did not survive. But we do have preserved samples, relative for observation. 
how does this look different from an offshore? A typical, these are ophroids, I should say, a typical brittle stuff. How many different? It's partly kind of like coral, like from like very far above when you can't see the thing. Oh, well, from a coral. Because like, like the one on the left, you can see it has like cameras in the center, and you can see the different like parts sticking out. I'd say uh, it like primarily differs from the ones you look at because I don't understand how these stuff move. <laughs> So very, very different. And how movement is achieved, still they are capable of using these arms. Movement, if we had them live in class, we would be able to witness that. But what, to their central disk area, may be hard to see, right out though. These are filter feeding organs. They have highly branched arms that utilize those arms for filtering out food out of the water column. Later, once we start talking about crinoids, we'll contrast them with crinoids in terms of, you know, they seem, they, it's not a completely similar body plan, but it is in the sense that they're doing, they're both filter feeding groups, and they both have these arms that are used or filtering out food from the water. Okay, so covered these two groups. Next, we'll target the echinoids, the urchins, and the sea cucumbers. And finally, we will finish our discussion of predators with crinoids. Echinoids. Again, that is kind of spiny. These are the true spiny echinoderms. They come in two main distinct types. Regular and irregular urchins, where the regular urchins are predominantly, they predominantly exhibit antiregular symmetry, while the irregular ones Exhibit bilateral symmetry. We'll see that when we look at affective anatomy of these and morphology of these. But in general, you can see that the regular urchins that are placed on the bottom here are more or less circular in shape. Sometimes you'll get them that are more like an oval than a circle. But they exhibit what appears in the periphery as just a radial symmetry once you start looking at the specifics of it. Not as well developed within asteroids or ophiroids, but there is an underlying pentaradial symmetry to these. Irregular urchins, shown at the top, sea biscuits on the right, sea sand, or sand dollars on the left, are bilaterally symmetrical in shape. And you'll see why they look because their anus has moved to a position that makes them bilaterally symmetrical. Around a thousand species, they occur all the way from the tropics to the poles. They could be rather abundant. They could be important in the interactions within various marine communities. Sea urchins are known to feed on kelp. If sea otters, the classic study, if sea otters are removed from an ecosystem, that causes an increase in the number of sea urchins in those areas because sea otters are a dominant predator of sea urchins. You get an increase in population of sea urchins. Those sea urchins tend to feed on kelp. They get a reduction in kelp in various communities. With asteroids and ophiroids, 
they have ossicles that occur within the cell, within their body wall. With echinoids, the ossicles form endoskeleton. It's typically referred to as the test of the urchin. With starfish and ophiroids, their two feet occur in ambulacral areas only on their oral surface. For echinoids, the ambulacral areas extend to the abdominal surface as well. So you can imagine if you took this isn't literally how they evolved, but if you took a starfish and folded its arms up around it to form a little globe, that's how the two feet are distributed around an echinoid. And you can, maybe you can find it, see when I'm that close up, but the two feet are present, extending out all over the surface of these just in those ambulacral areas, but on the ab world as well as the oral surface. See two feet emerging here. These bare things present on this lateral urchin are actually pedicellaria. Where did we hear about pedicellaria before? These are the cool little defensive structures on the surfaces of asteroids, not opioids. Not any other group except for echinoids. So these also possess pedicellaria. Here's an image of general anatomy without organic tissue being present but to see the general structure of these from the morphology of the test. We have, this is the apple view, this is the oral view, so the mouth is here, this is the bottom of the sea urchin, this is the top of the sea urchin with the anus, so it's got a complete digestive tract like asteroids have, with the mouth on the oral surface, the anus on the abdominal surface, there's a disc that surrounds the mouth area. There's comprised of five genital plates, which are being seen, the pentaradial symmetry. These genital plates all bear single pores. So there are five genital plates, each with a gonophore, an opening for the gonads to emerge from. So underneath, if this were a living individual, we would find five gonads, five gonads associated with each of those genital plates. I'll jump back to this before I do it. I think I'm talking about this paper little disc in the middle. Take a blown up view of it. Here are those five genital plates. Notice anything? Is it true pentaradial symmetry? Are all the genital plates the same exact size? This one is considerably larger. This one comprises the open for the water of asteroid tract. So this is this genital plate also serves as a modern core. The open 
opening for the water basket and carry. The test itself is made up of rows of ossicles that occur in distinct regions. There are two rows of ossicles here, and then a thinner row of two ossicles here. This, you can see these are got all these little spots in them. Those are pores where the two feet come through. These are the ambulacral zones or ambulacral areas of the test. These are the interambulacral areas. Five interambulacral, five ambulacral pairs of plates running in those areas. Those here, ambulacral zones and the interambulacral zones. Within at least most regular patients, not all, there, there can be exceptions. This one has very reduced spines. Anyone guess where this urchin might live? It's kind of like a helmet. Does it look like any other animal you ever saw? A turtle? Interesting. So it's, it's, it's interesting because it's very different than you know, the type of habitat that this occurs in. Turtles tend to occur, you know, they'll go down and sleep on the bottom, but they tend to be swimming. So maybe that shape is developed for aerodynamics, kind of. I guess you could say that this somewhat developed, not aero, hydro, hydrodynamics. We can say that this is developed for hydrodynamics too. There's spines emerging from the sides, very comet-like shape to it. This particular species that occurs, or this group of species, genus, occurs in the Lake Pacific, and they are typically found in very high wave energy environments. And so that is to keep them from getting knocked off a rock that they're attached to. It's very analogous to the shape of some gastropods, the limpets that occur in those areas, that have helmet-like shells, and it helps to prevent them from getting knocked off. But most urchins, some have very long spines, some have much shorter spines. All echinoids have spines. They tend to be more pronounced in regular urchins and irregular, although the sea biscuit has some rather long, skinny ones. Most of the spines on irregular versions tend to be small in shape. And here's a close up of the spine. This is the end that would intercalate with the base of the spine. So it's almost like the little elbow, so they're capable of moving in all directions. Some spines. You ever go into the Caribbean or the Pacific, there are various species that have long spines. And you don't want to get anywhere near them because they can get embedded in your foot, in your leg, in your arms, and so forth. And the spines have all these little reverse oriented barbs to them. So when they go in, they're not easily coming out. Presumably used for defensive purposes. Can be quite Irregular urchins are similar to regular urchins. And again, for echinoids, this ambulacral zone encompasses both the oral and the aboral surface. And we can see that here. The, on this figure, Roman numerals are the ambulacral zones, and the numbers are for interambulacral zones. There's five sets of each. Again, these are comprised of two ossicles, pairs of ossicles. The two feet occur in the ambulacral zones. Again, the two feet extend on to the half world surface. Within, so here's that's a sand dollar. Here is a sea biscuit. Again, we can see those same sets of rows, interambulacral and ambulacral 
the set of cores for the two feet of her. They would occur in these areas too. But they can, irregular erections, have these particular zones on the outworld surface. Okay. Refer to the tail here, where there are two feet, modified two feet, that emerge from the surface that are used in gas exchange. Notice anything different about these? If we don't have a zoomed in shot of the apical disc area. But if we did, what we find is that there are gonopores and there is genital plate forms of underpore, but we're missing something major. There is, and this is the penis, this is the show, the anus. But the anus is no longer in the center region of the test of the abdominal surface of the test. These do have a complete digestive tract. Does anyone see or know where the anus may be? Have to be somebody who's good Greek or just knows their irregularity. Where is the anus on these bees? There is one. But where is it? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. This periprop, peri means around, so what we do? Peristome, right, the, around the mouth. Prop, no, refers to prop, like a proctologist, right? Somebody deals with the dead end of the digestive tract. Also, proctoring an exam, that's I think why it's called prop, proctoring exam. I don't, that's not true, but. Periprop, this is the area immediately around the anus. The anus changed its position in the common ancestor of irregular erections to be laterally placed. And the sea biscuit, even the, the mouth of the sea biscuit, has changed position. They're not in the center of the oral surface. They move. So you can see this is, well, there's some remnants of the bilateral symmetry in terms of the placement of the inter and interambulacral and ambulacral regions. These are bilaterally symmetrical because of the offset position of the anus that occurs within this paraphone. So here's an image from the text. Aspects of internal anatomy to couple this with what we've learned about the external anatomy. And we'll go through some of the different systems. So, you know, and here we again we can see this is, this is a regular urchin, of course. The paraprop region is located at the top. The anus is there. The mouth is here. If we were to trace the water vascular system, there is an external opening, like most classes of planners have, to the water vascular system that leads into the stomach canal, which is connected to the rain canal. subsequently connected to five radial canals. And again, you can kind of imagine, we have a starfish that we kind of put together and sewed up. Those radial canals come up towards the apical towards the parallel, continue on to the parallel. And then within those, from those radial canals, we have lateral canals, and then two feet. Two feet that are more similar to two feet of asteroids than ophiroids. Remember, ophiroids also have these ampullae. They don't have suckers. Two feet of echinoids do. Two feet are used for movement. Oftentimes, you'll have two feet that we may have a sea urchin on the side of the tank because it's attached with all of its two feet. Spores for the two feet on the ambulacral zones of the test. Digestive tract falling from bottom to top, the mouth. Aristotle's lantern, which is a, a 
radial symmetry exhibiting feeding structure made up of ossicles and various muscles. Leads in to the esophagus and intestine, stomach. Many regular urchins feed on algae, so they're using Aristotle's lantern to break off small pieces of the algae, and then are digesting that through the digestive tract and ultimately leads to our anus. Reproduction. Highlighted these already, so they're gonopores, genopores, associated with the genital plates. And internally, we have gonads. Five sets of gonads. Yes? Blue ones are the water vasculars. And they do have nerves, nerve rings, they don't have a centralized nervous system. And see this within bilateral asymmetrical axa. Oh, and then, I almost forgot. As we saw in asteroids, Ethanoids also have these kinds of solarians. I showed one of these in the earlier slide with the flower urchins. Now this tox off new seats. The tox for the fact that they can be very painful to the touch. They do have these poisonous or venomous jaws that they use for protection. And they can be painful if you put them on a top part of your body. I have not tested, but I will not handle them either with that glove. But they're very, very beautiful. That's why they're called flower agents, but the beauty of these are can be dangerous. And again, it's similar to what we saw in asteroids. They're different in their structure in terms of the jaws and overall this one has three parts to them. So are they homologous features that are shared by these groups and, and present common ancestor or are they uniquely derived? Open to speculation. The feeding apparatus, again this Aristotle's lantern, presumably because it looks like an old Greek lantern. Something that we'll be able to see in lab. Well, I know we have some that are observed. We also have lots of virgins available in the lab. Well, we should. Made up of a variety of, of parts to it that are derived from ossicles and then various muscles. And that's what these animals use to eat. These occur in regular as well as most irregular urchins. Sea biscuits don't have an Aristotle's lantern. Sea stars do. They're, they tend to be much flatter than the Aristotle's lantern that we see in regular urchins, but they do occur in sea stars. They look like little dove-like things, so oftentimes people make sure the art part of the dove-like parts of the Aristotle's lantern of sand dollars. Reproduction, similar to what we've discussed already. Most, vast majority are dioecious. Some will brood their eggs, and so it's a direct form of development where the individuals emerge and into a small juvenile stage that develops into an adult, whereas others produce, vast majority of others, producing free swimming larvae, the Echinopludius larvae, that are similar to the Plutia larvae that we saw of the opioids. Development proceeds, there are certain cells that again develop into the juvenile stage and it's like it completely kicks over the larval stage and then metamorphosis, undergoes metamorphosis to become a shell. Is an 
this you know, piece of ocean occluding larva, showing the resemblance of the echino to the ocean occluding. And again, what these things have, complete digestive tract, with mouth and anus. It's not the same mouth and anus that develop within the individual that is produced from this. So there's drastic remodification from larval to adult stage. The ciliary bands that extend around the length of this are supported by heart structures, spicules within, so they're capable of some movement, and the ciliary tracts help aid in feeding. See, they're all oriented around the mouth, they can bring food things to the mouth. I showed this at the beginning because we had time, but this is the same video I showed earlier on targetion development. Let's see if I can go to where they show the plea activity. You can already see the juvenile stage beginning to emerge from the Pluvia larva. Right. Any questions about economics? Not sure what's impacted them also along the west coast of the U.S., but they declined in numbers there as well. There's a decade ago when I visited the tide pools, urchins, urchins everywhere, these beautiful purple urchins everywhere. Visiting there now, you're lucky you see a few dozen. All right, the next group are the sea cucumbers. This group is very distinct from the others. It's a sister group of echinoids. So thinking about how this particular body plan may have developed, where you have the anus at one end, I assume it's an end, I'm not positive, and the mouth at the other end. <coughs> You have a body that is devoid of you know, hard endoskeleton to it. All these other groups have had ossicles that are fairly predominant within their tissues. Sea cucumbers have really small ones that are embedded that are not easily seen unless you take some of the tissue and dissolve it in bleach or something equivalent. They shared a common ancestor with sea urchins. They've lost the predominant endoskeleton and they've been greatly expanded in this aboral oral axis. So if the common ancestor of both groups was kind of sea urchin like, lost the spines, ossicles got smaller, and great extension of it. Even these are, so we got definite bilateral symmetry emerged in these groups, but no true cephalization. No concentration of sensory structures near the front part, the oral end of the beast. No centralized nervous system either. We have a question. Yeah, what effect did the ossicles have? What effect did the ossicles have? The ossicles. So the ossicles, ossicles are a characteristic feature These are the heart structures that form the test of the sea urchins. They're greatly expanded, large ossicles that two of them come together, or sets of two come together to form ambulacra, linder ambulacra, there it is. They are the parts that are embedded in, so they form the test of urchins. Added 
mighty wall of asteroids and opioids and give it its predominant structure. And it has spines and so forth that you see in an asteroid where opioids are produced from the ossicles. They occur in the body wall. See cucumbers? But they're quite small, quite reduced. They also occur in primates, as we'll see. So ossicles are small little, you know, it could be a like if we think of cicules, those are hard parts that are produced by cells in the sponge. These are hard parts that are produced by cells in the environment. Made up of calcium carbonate. So this is a unique feature of sea cucumbers, these highly reduced obstacles which just simply occur in the body wall. They do have a serum. They do have the ability to rapidly change shape. If anyone's ever played with a sea cucumber, they tend to be, you can come up, and they can, they can be very elongate and soft. But when bothered, they'll condense their body to a small, hard shape, almost rock-like, presumably to defend against the heat. There are so see cucumbers. This is around 1700 species, like a big group. They can occur in deep water habitats as well as shallow water, which is particularly abundant. There are there are lots of studies of sea cucumbers out there because they're the important food source. The countries. Um, there are there. Most of them are pelagic. Monday showed a video at the beginning of class of a pelagic sea cucumber. So there are some that are capable of swimming for short distances or remaining pelagic and filter feeding. I hate to define things based on the things that they don't have, but to compare them to other groups, you know, they don't have these predominant ossicles that we've already talked about, like ultralights, primates, they too do not possess pencillaria, so pencillaria are unique to echinoids and asteroids only. Also, the modern fork, which is the opening to the water vascular system, which is external on most other species, is internal. So it opens into the salomic cavity. So the water vascular system is open up to fluids within the salomic cavity not in the external medium. Most other echinoids have antiradial symmetry in their five gonads, or five sets of gonads, in case of some asteroids. These guys only have a single gonad, they tend to be dioecious, but there are examples of microdidic sea cucumbers. And one very unique thing about them is that for gas exchange, they actually have structure 
asteroids have a brachial wheel, a normal brachium. Ophoroidians have a respiratory tree. This image this is an image from the text showing aspects of the general internal anatomy, oral, fear, front, I think we more likely to call it, and rear, fear. Yes? Where is the I will, go, I will go through that. Good question. Lots of good questions. So we'll talk. We'll first mention aspects of the water vascular system. The water vascular system is similar to that of other canoderms in terms of we have a ring canal from which radial canals merge, giving rise to two feet that have two feet because these are worm-like and there's a front and back there's a bottom and top so typically two feet tend to be most well developed on what we consider the bottom part of the animal and less than well developed along the top this is a water vascular system so there's solution within this that allows for movement of the two feet. The madre poride does not open to the outside. The madre poride is internal. And so salomic cavity is full of salomic fluid. That fluid is what these sea cucumbers utilize within the water vascular system. So it's able to draw in fluid through the mantra port from the sea. The digestive tract starting to happen. Sea cucumbers have modified two feet that form tentacles, and tentacles can be a variety of different structures. We'll see a couple examples in the coming slide. That are used either for deposit feeding, taking sediments and so forth from the bottom, and digesting them and getting the organic matter from them. Or they can be used for filter feeding. Leads into a pharynx, what's considered as large part of the pharynx, our corporeal bulb a large part of the pharynx into a stomach and intestine and into this area that's referred to as a cloaca. A cloaca within animals is typically a cavity or an opening that is associated with the digestive tract and some other system. Oftentimes it's a reproductive system. Here is the, the respiratory tree that is tied in with the end of the intestine that ultimately goes out the rear. So these are animals that breathe essentially through their anus. Water is drawn in. There's cloacal muscles that allow for water to be drawn in. And gas exchange then takes place within these respiratory tree structures. talked about earlier, the body wall and the ossicles. These are what some of these ossicles look like in sea cucumbers. And as you can see, 20 microns, these are rather tiny structures. We will see 
and the tests we had in the lab, we saw this on the image I showed earlier, that obstacle, single obstacles of, that are incorporated into the sea urchin test are quite large. You see them with your naked eye. These you need a microscope in order to see. They can be distinct for different species. Oftentimes they're used for diagnosing different taxa. Modified tooth peak. This individual here, it's clear that you'd be using those to target at least you might show the video that I'm be speaking about. Is placing these into sediment sand, or in this case, coral, and taking those putting them into the mouth, and then digesting the organic matter that comes from those sediments. Constantly eating. And there's, like you can see this one, much more feathery shape. This is filter feeding. Put those into the water column and trap particles. And then do the same, place those into the mouth. And this, this little video down here is just an interesting video because it shows a couple of things. It talks about, it actually talks about how important sea urchins are for keeping habitats from the blooms of algae and so forth on them. But it also shows this breathing nature of the rear end of the sea cucumber. 1750. So recycling lots of sediments. This is a tropical sea cucumber species, and often when they're diving in tropics with a lot of sand like this, you'll see the track of the sea cucumber. And, and you know, those, those, those poops are literally that, that thick in diameter. So this is, this is like a of the giant piece. But you see how it's opening up? It's, it's not pooping here. Opening up the collecting. You can see little particles, right? They don't draw in and bringing water into the respiratory tree for respiration. I think our book talked about it. I can't remember what they're doing. Right our book talks about it, but there is uh, yeah, a pearlfish. It's a long, skinny fish that lives in the intestine of a sea cucumber. So sometimes if you're watching a sea cucumber, you'll see a little fish swim up the anus. And, and, you know, this, this video is intriguing. They're, they're, they suggest that they're responsible for maintaining the health of areas where they occur. Sea cucumbers, again, like most other canidorms, are dioecious. There are exceptions. They're hermaphroditic species. They tend to spawn their gametes. They will often have this particular pose where they are up off the surface, spawn their gametes. And then development, like with other sea urchins, we see particular larval stages. Most sea cucumbers go through three different stages, auricularia larval stage, and it has complete digestive tract. It's, it's similar in aspects to the other larvae that we've seen in the conidorms, but has a distinct shape, and a ciliary bands around it. Subsequently, develops into what's called an ovularia larva, and then which this one almost looks like a early juvenile stage, but it's a larval stage when it settles, it becomes patula. All right, so the final group we'll cover of the, I'll cover the extent of the kind of nerves, are the crinoids. And again, these, these, these images are 
pretty useful because they tend to summarize a lot of information on them. What we saw for sink cucumbers, moderate chlorine and sink kernels. That's a unique feature of it as far as on this particular branch. With thin crinoids, they have no moderate chlorine. Moderate chlorine is absent. How water, how fluids are getting into the water vascular system? I'm not sure, presumably through osmosis through the walls of one of them. The other unique feature about crinoids is that they have open ambulacral grooves, which is the only other group of echinoderms that has open ambulacral grooves. Nobody remembers them. Asteroids. Asteroids. The asteroids. So everyone else has the ocher waves have little plates covering them. The echinoids are urging through pores. The sea cucumbers, they're ambulacral areas, but they're they're not open grooves where the two feet emerge. Crinoids are the only other group aside from the asteroid that have open ambulacral zones from which two feet emerge. And the crinoids come in two different flavors, two main groups that have distinct morphologies to them. They have similarities in morphology, but they tend to differ in terms of whether or not they have a stalk. The ones on the left are the stalked crinoids. Also known as sea lilies. There are somewhere around 100 species of sea lilies that are extant. It's a deep sea things. Unstocked crinoids are known as feather stars. They're shown here on the right. Somewhere around 600 species. These are mostly deep water, so they don't have any at night. There's some deep water feather stars, but there are many that are rather shallow water. And they tend to, like this image shows, be active during the night. And always during the day, they're hidden in a crevice or a burrow, but they will come out at night, get on top of structures within their habitat in order to filter feed. So both of these engage in filter feeding. What is unique about crinoids we already talked about the fact that they have no modern forest. Like asteroids, they have open and lateral grooves from which two feet emerge. However, unlike asteroids, by squeezing together muscles, and so it allows for extension of the two foot. But crinoids, like opioids, do not have them. Echinoids and asteroids are the only ones that have polarity, so obviously these have no moderate chlorine, also no polarity. Anything else you notice from these images that is different than the other kind of drums we've seen so far? The 
missing. The stock is here, and the calyx, the pelvic arms, is kind of oriented to the side. Where's the mouth on this beast? It's in the center of those arms. What about these guys? Feathers start. The mouth underneath all of those arms? No. It's in the center of all of those arms. These function in filter feeding by having mucus secreted on the arms, and then the two feet deliver the material to the mouth. So what is unique as well about primates is their body toward body orientation in terms of the fact that the all surface, which bears the mouth. The ambulacral areas are on the oral surface. You all know how to spell ambulacral by now. Ambulacral. And they're associated with feeding. Here's a diagram showing some of the aspects of anatomy. This calyx is the main, main part of the animal. And the stock forms, there's a stock comprised of ossicles. There are lots of species of sea lilies. I think there are thousands. I don't have a written down, but there are thousands of species of extinct sea lilies. Paleozoic seas were very rich in sea lilies. If you go to fossil deposits, say from the Devonian or Carboniferous, you often find lots of pieces of crinoid stems within those deposits. They're very rich in ancient habitats. They're not so diverse today. So we have a calyx from which these arms emerge. The arms have extensions from the sides, the pinnules, reminiscent of the octoporals, the tentacles of octoporals. There are typically five arms within a crinoid. Feather stars go, they have five arms, and then those arms branch immediately after where the arm is attached into the calyx. Oops, I didn't say so. The mouth is embedded within the oral surface. It is also is within this calyx in the central part in, inside of these arms where the arms are emerging from. So it's got a U-shaped digestive system. Mouth, not too far away from me. One thing to think about, so I mentioned this earlier, that rather similarity, not, not exactly, we look too closely, but feather stars and basket stars, similar in terms of they're both using these multitude of arms for suspension feeding. But how are they, are they different? And it's a good way of thinking about how crinoids are different than ophiroids. Obviously, these guys have a moderate part on their oral surface. They have no anus. These have an anus located on their oral surface. These have oral surfaces up. These have oral surfaces down. These have open ambulacral areas. These have closed. So forth. There's lots of differences between these and maybe other taxa that look similar to them. Frankly, I don't think these things look all too similar. 
But I know when I've been out and I've seen feather stars while diving, I think, oh, look, a mascot star. And then I get a closer look. I don't think I'm ignoring them. It's a crying mode. So I always get confused. The rest of you may not. But it's a good way of thinking what the differences are between these major classes of the universe. Reproduction, just repeating myself, echinoderm, most species are dioecious, most spawn their gametes, and fertilization takes place in the water column. These go through what is referred to as a regularius like stage that we just saw, similar to the auricularia larvae, the sea cucumbers, and doliolaria larva. It's another stage, and then that develops into the But it's a similar type of indirect life history where there are planktonic larval stages that ultimately settle to produce the adult. So those are the echinoderms. Again, most of our lab is going to focus on the echinoderms this week. I'm still not positive we have any live enteropneus, at least. We don't have any live terabytes, but we're hoping to get live enteropneus in the lab for observing them, for looking at their feeding features. Um, and that's what I'll conclude today's lecture with. We have nine minutes, that should be enough for hemichordates. Buccal, the verticulum, something that's unique to hemichordates is that all of these middle salomic ducts that are unique to them. Oh, here, question. Yeah, so there's a cryo, it's basically asexual. That's fine. It's sexual reproduction. I, I'm sorry if I rushed through that, but they, so they will spawn gametes. The gametes will fertilize, so you get a sperm fertilizing egg, oh. typically in the water column. And then subsequent cleavage. Okay. Um, I don't think there's any sexual reproduction in any kind of girl. There are no colonial forms. So we don't have body reproduction. We do have that anyway. So not, okay. All right. One of the things we talked about at the beginning of lecture on Monday was the similarity between the larvae of Enteropneus at least, and Bicamaria larvae of asteroids. So there's similarity in structure of these beasts. Otherwise, these are elongate worm like things that exist in bilateral symmetry. And previous thoughts about this group as reflected in its name. They were thought to be close relatives of us, chordates, are they referred to as hemichordates, because they possess some features, little gill slits, gill pores, look like they also have a notochord within them, which is a unique feature of chordates. So they are presumed to represent chordates, or at least be a close relative of chordates. But again, molecular results have shown that they're close relatives of these kind of there are two flavors of hemichordates. The acorn worms, they're in the group Enteropneusta, which literally means entero for gut. Neusta refers to breathing. Gut breathing literally means Commonly, you know, how common it is, but the common name is acorn worms. And they can be rather small worms to rather large things for a variety of different habitats. They're all marine. They're all marine corvids. The other group shown on the right, a single individual or multiple individuals. Uh, 
Catabranchs, Catabranchia, Caro, Pterodactyl, Wing Finger, I guess that's what that means. This is Wing Gill, Frank, or Frankia for Gill. Because of these tentacles that are emerging from which they feed. Carabranchs tend to be filter feeders, while most acorn worms deposit their sun to a suspension. Here are some different images of acorn worms showing the three predominant regions to the body, the trunk, the collar, and the proboscis. The proboscis extends out the front of the mouth. So the mouth is located in front, posterior, or anterior to the collar. It enters into a digestive tract where there are gill slits in the pharyngeal region of the tract by which water can be expelled during feeding. So these have many gill slits or pores. Typically, these just have one pair of gill slits. And there are some species that don't have any. Within the region where the pores occur, it's highly vascularized. So these animals are not using this system for filter feeding, like we'll see in the protochordates. They're instead using it for gas exchange. associated with vascularization. that presumably gives proboscis some support. It was this structure, though, that people interpreted to represent the notochord that we find also in chordates, one of the defining features of chordates. Any chordates, most are dioecious and engage in external fertilization with production of different larval stages. An area that resemble the bipinarium larvae of asteroids. And the carabranchs, um, you can think of them as modified versions of an acorn worm in which tentacles are emerging from the collar, used in filter feeding, so material transported to the mouth and consumed. But these are unique in that they're colonial. So they undergo asexual reproduction to produce multiple individuals. As we've heard before, these are always that are the individuals comprising a colony. Here we see a single individual. Here is an individual with a second individual. 
these mostly caecious external fertilization and the production of what appears to be a planular type larva that we saw in Nigerians. These ciliated stages of development settle down, ultimately develop into juvenile hairbrite, secretes a tube, and then ultimately will bud additional individuals and they will form this interconnected set of tubes comprised of multiple zooids. Can I say? Perfect. So, any coordinates are an interesting group. They're not all that large in terms of numbers of species. There's only about 130 stamp species. Most of these are acorn worms, but they can be important. They're, they're one of the preferred prey of one of my own. Thank you, everybody. Lab this week. Good luck with the weather and the snow. And please let me know if you have any questions. I brought you guys today. Good on Zoom.